Hello, my name is Peter Gray. Welcome to the December 2021 session of Writing Arborist Reports. This session will be presented by Mark Hartley, and we will be talking about keeping things in the right section of a report. Excellent. Well, um, tonight we're, we're going to quickly go over a, well, not so quickly, we're going to go over and have a look at a, a report and, and see what happens when things start to get mixed up. And um, before this evening started, um, I was talking to Peter about it. This is uh, uh, one of my favourite reports for looking at this, this issue, and it's by no means meant to be an indictment on the author of the report. It's just a good example of how we all stuff up at some stage or other um, in different levels. But this is a really good example of how that starts to alter your view as a uh, reader uh, of the report. And one of the purposes of writing a report is to communicate. And so the moment we start to miscommunicate, um, we start to have issues in terms of achieving those end goals. And the report is not, um, it's not a great report. It's not a poor report, but it definitely miscommunicates. And um, one of the comments I said to Peter is, is, I think a part of what's happened is by not following the logical processes of a technical report, or a scientific style report, um, the author's got, got himself confused and the author's got himself in the situation where he hasn't thought things through properly. So one of the aims of a technical report is to help you, the author, think through the steps. Make sure you've crossed your I's, dotted your T's, you've thought about the what facts, what observations you've got, what material you've got, and you've given that a lot of time. Um, and then you've weighed that evidence, that that tangible stuff that, you know, hopefully if, if we as a, as we as arborists go out and, and do the observation stage, there should be a reasonably high degree of agreement on the observations. So if the tree's um, 25 metres tall, you know, plus or minus a, a metre or two, there should be some agreement that it's a big tree. Um, we're not going to get someone come back and say it's a tiny tree. Likewise... If we say the tree is in fair health, well, there might be some variation in that, but there should be some issues that suggest that it's not in good or ideal health, and there should be some evidence that suggests that it's not in poor health. So the, the observational stage or the evidentiary stage of a technical report, there should be a fairly high degree of agreement. And ideally, um, if we're doing that going back to last blocks as an expert witness, we would find that there shouldn't be too much disagreement between the experts on that area. You know, there might be differences of opinion in terms of um, use of ordinal words like high, medium and low or uh, small, medium and big. Um, but the general meat of it all should be the same. That You know, if it's an 80 centimetre diameter tree, then it should be 80 centimetres plus or minus maybe a centimetre either way. Um, we shouldn't have someone saying it's 80 centimetres and someone saying it's 2.4 metres. And um, I, I can recall a, um, an expert's report that that was the difference between the two parties. One was absolutely firm that it was 2.5 metres in diameter and the second party was 80 centimetres in diameter. I said to the, the guy that had it at 2.5, I said, um, Billy Bloggs for the sake of it, Billy, you know, what happened? And he said, uh, he said, I measured the circumference and he said, and I forgot to convert it back to diameter. I said, well, once you realise that, why didn't you say anything? He said, I didn't want it to make it look like I didn't know what I was doing. And I said, the moment you argued about that and continued on, it made it look like you didn't know what you were doing. So um, there's a good pointer for you. If you do make one of those mistakes, um, confess it early, confess it quickly. I, I do it. I mean, I make mistakes still to this day. Um, I'm a human being, not a human doing. Um, I make mistakes doing things. Um, so uh, if, if that happens, um, um, correct it quickly and, and accept that mistakes happen. It's not a necessarily an indictment of you or an arborist. Not admitting to the mistake is an indictment on you as an individual. Uh, um, and certainly in the court, the court views it very much that way. Um, so uh, Billy Bloggs lost a lot of credibility in his uh, evidence before the court because the court thought if he's prepared to be obstinate about something as obviously wrong as that, then his uh, 
not going to be reliable when it comes to other things as well. So um, important part there. So when it, where the difference will often be is how we interpret those observations, what information we bring to the, the table and a, and a really beautifully crafted report. We'll look at both sides of the argument. Now, it's rare that you get the time, it's rare that you get the funding, it's rare that a client will be obliging enough to say, look, yes, I know you can get this report done in six or seven hours, but hell, take the 20 hours and do a really good job of it. Um, the time when you tend to get that leeway more is expert witness reports, but in things like an oral cultural impact assessment report, oftentimes you're not going to have uh, the client say, look, take an extra 10 or 15 hours, do some extra research and present both sides of it for us. Um, usually what they want to get out of it is as quickly as possible. And at least that's my experience. Rob and Vicky, uh, much the same your side. Um, clients want uh, things done quick and cheap rather than uh, saying, look, here's an unlimited budget and I'm, I'm doing really well at the moment. Just take your time. Yeah, the, my experience is they want quick and cheap. The cheaper, the better for them, but it's getting that balance. Yeah, so it's, it's this balancing act, and it's it's something that we do in, in writing all the time. We balance between what the ideal would be and um, the cost in providing that and the time that that uh, adds in terms of your own um, resources in doing that. Um, so all of those are, are going to have an impact on uh, what you do. So... But keep in mind that an ideal, an ideal discussion will consider all sides and explain why you've said something. So, for example, and this is one that comes up in, in trees and development sites all the time. The Australian standard says um, keep 12 times trunk diameter from the tree. You can have a minor incursion, 10 percent, anything more than that. Then the role of the consulting arborist or the project arborist is to demonstrate the tree will remain viable, 3.3.3 and 3.3.4 of the standards. So that's our job. Um, how do we do that? Well, we're, we're going to go and say, look, this is my experience. Here are some examples. Uh, this is what different authors say. Um, well, the dilemma is the authors don't agree. Um, I can show you a report by a, a well-respected arborist out of New Zealand who recently showed that there was some influence on um, trees. If you cut it 12 times trunk diameter and you did nothing, you could end up with um, uh, having some form of damage. Is that my um, iPhone that's causing that issue, Peter? I don't, hopefully it's not. What's the issue? Oh, sorry, it was just showing iPhone on the screen and that was it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know who that is. Might uh, be you. Killed or mine, just in case it was my one. Um, so, yes, and it's a great little article. Um, and it's one now that's embedded into the training package. So uh, hopefully this is one that we'll see a little bit more of. One of the things that's interesting, though, in that, that particular paper is the roots were cut at 12 times trunk diameter and then no aftercare was provided at all. And so the question is, what would have happened if we had mulched or if we had irrigated? Would that have made a difference? Um, and the, there's evidence that goes the other way that says, yes, if you provide a modicum of care, uh, you can get closer. In fact, Hamilton and Harris uh, talk about three times trunk diameter. That's a lot closer. Smiley talks in one of his papers about potentially coming as close as the trunk without losing structural stability. Um, and at three times trunk diameter, not a lot. Um, so, so there, there are a number of uh, different authors and in a really ideal uh, boracultural impact assessment report, you would weigh all of those up. Um, so I don't know who's on an iPhone, but somebody's on an iPhone. That's not mine. That's good. Yeah, um, you muted it. So if that person would like to say something, then just let us know. Okay. So, yeah, look... Um, so that's, that's a good discussion. Um, in that discussion, your paragraphs would be based on a single concept, each one a little concept. So um, you'd look at saying, well, look, you know, X, Y, Z author has said 12 times trunk diameter, blah, blah, blah. However, uh, note that there was no mention of aftercare and without aftercare, then there may be some influence, um, but it wasn't significant regardless. Um, it was just measurable. 
Um, so at 12 times trunk diameter, we get some measurable uh, changes in the health and the growth of the, the tree. Uh, not that it's necessarily long-term, um, it's just perceivable. On the other hand, you know, 1828, uh, Henry Stewart publishes his textbook and he, he talks about it, or British Winter Garden, um, William Barron, 1854, and William actually measures the growth rate of trees after he's moved them with uh, the Allenton method, which is Henry Stewart's method. Uh, and he's talking about cutting as small as three times trunk diameter all the way around to move these trees and then records their growth rate before and afterwards. So uh, it's really the first scientific uh, analysis of um, impact of root cutting that, that we find in English literature. So that you would discuss all those. And in the discussion, you wouldn't come to a conclusion, but in the discussion, it would be it should be reasonably apparent what the conclusions will be. Then in your conclusions, of course, you uh, conclude. And then depending on how you like to do it, whether you like to have recommendations before or afterwards, for me, it's after the conclusion, then I'll give you the recommendations at that point of time. Or um, I don't use recommendations now. I use a, a wonderful term, specifications, uh, thanks to Peter Caster. Um, Peter pointed out that once he had said uh, to the builder, here are the recommendations. The builder said, well, they're just recommendations, so I don't have to do it. Um, so I found that just simply changing that one word to specifications avoids that misinterpretation again. And that's our role as a, an arborist is to communicate. So um, I call them tree protection specifications for that very reason. So let's have a look at... Um, oh, Peter, you'll need to give me permission to share my screen, thanks. Okay. Um, You've got enable enable participant share screen sharing. Um, yes. Okay. Participants. No, I'm not seeing it. Um, I'm not seeing. I can do it. So if I go to participants. Yes, participants is where it is. Thanks, Peter. So allow local. No, I can't. I've got chat, stop video, spotlight for everyone, make host, rename, allow to record local files. Would that be it? Yeah, I think that must be it. Let's have a go at that. Yes. <laughs> Uh, oh, no, uh, re that's record local files. No, it's not record. No. So you can undo that one. So whilst Peter's going through that, who's had, had the chance to have a look at the um, the report that Peter sent out? Is anyone, Rob, Vicky? Oh, I didn't get it. No, sorry. Uh, okay. I just sent uh, an email to everybody just a few minutes ago with the um, Dropbox link and also sent it in November. So I'm still getting a host disabled. Yeah, so I can make you I can make you the host. How about that? No, you don't. Yeah, you can, but you shouldn't be able to do that. Uh, can't see it. Uh, and uh, click my name and go more. Yeah. Will it allow you when you go to more to share? No. I think you might have to make him host. Yeah, I'll make you the host. Okay. We should figure this one out for the next time, Peter. Yeah. We didn't have this problem last time, though. I think we had, might have had it already sorted out beforehand. Okay. Um, so let's see if I can do it this time. Yes, I can share now. That's good. Okay, I'll make the screen larger. Uh, it's probably too large. It's 1,700 times. That's okay. Can everyone read that? Yeah, that's all right. Okay, great. So this is a uh, um, Pikus Sonic Tomograph test report. Uh, it's for a tree in a park. It's repaired for somebody. It's prepared by somebody. Title page, perfectly good, well laid out. An executive summary. Again, I don't mind whether it's there or after the table of contents. 
I'm old fashioned. I want them to try and get somewhere further down. So it would be after the table of contents, at least that way they see what's in the report. Um, Adam Tom uh, and I have often discussed this. Adam won't put an executive summary in. He says, if you want to uh, know where the end information is, read the conclusions. If you can't bother, be bothered to read the conclusion, don't waste your time on the report. Um, so I'm fine with a, an executive summary or a conclusion either way. Um, so it's a council's commissioned it. Um, we know that the subject trees are two Morton Bay figs. Um, and um, again, just pedanticism at my side, that should be italicized. Um, and down here where we get tree one has confirmed Philinus. Philinus is not italicized. And the reason that Philinus is not italicized there is that it's talking about the genus and the genus by itself is not a scientific species. Uh, it's just a genus, so it's not italicized. We only italicize species. Uh, the species epitaph. So if it's uh, Ficus sp, sp, sp is not a scientific uh, name. So the sp is not italicized. Ficus would be. Um, so this this would be Philinus sp, and then we know we're talking about a specific species of Philinus. Um, so it's just pedanticism. And I, you know, I remember once uh, somebody said to me, look. When XYZ uh, reads these reports, um, they go through them with a red pen and mark them up. And uh, I thought, yeah, you know, that's really getting to the pedantic stage. The purpose is to communicate. Does it communicate clearly? It communicates clearly enough. Um, but it's just those little fine finesse things. You know, when I serve the, 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 set the kitchen, uh, the dining table for Christmas, I managed to put the knives on the right-hand side, the forks on the left-hand side, because that's what tradition says. Um, you know, you could put them the other way around. I'm sure that there wouldn't be a person who wouldn't be able to figure out how to pick them up and swap them around the right way. And I figure it's the same here. You know, there wouldn't be a person who can't figure out to italicize what they'd need to. Um, I don't think that reflects on the, um, the knowledge. It just uh, reflects on, on uh, pedanticism. Um, that is important. And, you know, if I was looking at that and reviewing that from a, an external point of view, I'd say, is this person being particular about things? Is this person taking care? Um, next thing I notice is this is a paragraph here. That's a big paragraph. Um, and that paragraph should all relate around this first sentence. Tree one has confirmed for Linus from the pathology testing, see Appendix 4, and tomogram indicates the decay present at the test site due to patchiness of colour shown in the tomogram. Too complex, too difficult to follow. So the report starts to get a little hard, even at the first stage of um, the summary. A table of contents, which is excellent, it's automatically generated. You can see that everything lines up. And realistically, there shouldn't be a table of contents in an arborist report that isn't automatically generated. Um, and if you're not sure on how to automatically generate one in the template that we have on um, Dropbox for a standard uh, re arborist report, um, it's, it's all automatically generated. The table of content works on headings. And Peter and I, again, were discussing before the meeting and we said um, before the next block, we'll put up a template for you for a paragraph numbered report for an expert witness report. So we'll put you a, a template for an expert witness report uh, along with some standard sort of phrases and things for you to, to play with it. So you've got that there. Um, so now we have an introduction, the report's been commissioned, where it's at. Um, there's a little location of where it's at. And again, there's difference of uh, opinions here. My view of it is, um, if this is written for a council, I'm guessing the council knows where the trees are. So I probably wouldn't add um, a location map in there. Um, having a picture of the trees, that's fine. My view of it is any image should be uh, talked about in the paragraph before or the paragraph afterwards, otherwise it's just padding. Um, so the question is in this paragraph, does he talk about the trees? No. So, and 
He doesn't talk about it afterwards. So all he's done is put some padding in. What he should have said is that trees can be seen in relation to the um, toilet block and whatever the road is. Um, again, you know, wouldn't take much to, to tie the image, that particular image in. Then there's um, point two is a methodology. Now, I know this is pedanticism again, Peter, but is it a methodology? No, no method, the methodology is a, 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 um, a comparison of methods. Yeah, a comparison of methods. So there's no comparison of methods. If you'd been looking at maybe um, uh, impedance tomography and sound tomography and uh, X-ray as a comparative measure of looking at decay, that would be a methodology. In this case, it's a method. It's what is actually done. So it is very widely used, though, Mark. It is very widely used. It is, and you know why? <laughs> because using big words makes you sound very photosynthesis, <laughs> um, and and that's unfortunately uh, what happens. We start to get used to using these things in that way, and it just becomes accepted. But uh, indeed, it is not a methodology. It is a method, um, and. You know, nothing wrong with using a method, typical setup. Uh, he talks about um, some of the information and how it works. I would have probably put half of this in as an appendix. Um, I would have simply said uh, a tomograph was done using a whatever, whoever's a Picus uh, tomograph. Um, it was a sonic tomograph. Um, I probably would have only had one or two um, sentences in a paragraph about that and the rest in the appendix. Same about analysing. Um, I would have just simply had maybe a paragraph in uh, about that. So in analysing the tomograph, um, the colour of the graph was used to determine the proportion of decay found in the stem. And that's probably about it. The rest I would have put in the appendix. Um, TR ratio, again, um, I probably would have said an action threshold was set um, where um, further consideration needed to be given when 70% um, of the radius was decayed or where 50% of the um, surface area was decayed. Um, location of the tests. Now, this is a test result and a test result would normally go into an observation. Anything you can see, test, any test you get uh, done elsewhere, any aerial images you're looking at, anything you're examining is in the observations or in the um, results or in the whatever you want to title that second part of your report or third part. You're going to have a brief uh, or instructions or an aim. You're going to have uh, a method, um, which you may include some limits or some um, um, uh, things that you haven't done. Um, and then you're going to come into this observational stage. What, what is the science we're relying on? So the test results are something that you're relying on. It's something that I should be able to go out and repeat. I should be able to go out and do exactly the same. And in fact, um, a few years ago, I was called in by a community action group because a fig tree was about to be removed. And the results that they got was based on a really questionable science. It was blunting up a drill bit, drilling in, and then looking at the shavings to determine whether there was decay or not. And, and I questioned the reliability of that. So I tested and I got a very different result altogether using a, a resistor graph. Um, so hence why that observation, if, if, if what we observe is wrong, if what we've measured is wrong, then the rest of the report's irrelevant. It really is critical that we separate the stuff. If, if I've looked at some images, and again, I've, I was involved in a court case a number of years ago where uh, aerial images were being examined from a helicopter and they determine the amount that the, the branches had overhung the wires. And having done scientific photography, I thought, hang on a second here, uh, perspective is going to vary. The, the Where I am in relation to the tree and the wires will vary how much those branches overhang. So we're able to go back to some um, street view images, um, measure the differences, recalculate, and determine the amount of overhang. Um, the, the, the assumption that the trees overhung by as much as they did because of the aerial image taken from the helicopter was erroneous. And so once one part of the report is erroneous, the rest starts to fall um, because any conclusions you have are conclusions about 
um, erroneous information in discussions you have are discussions about erroneous information. So really important um, to have anything that, that needs or could be or may be repeatable or observable in that one section, test results, observations, um, you know, uh, uh, statements of fact, whatever you want to call that little area, um, that should all be um, stuff that's essentially repeatable. And I said, there's some degree of subjectivity there. I mean, uh, interestingly enough, tree one was measured at 1100 millimetres. I'm going to take a punt that it wasn't measured at 1100 millimetres. I'm going to punt that plus or minus two or three or four or five millimetres um, is probably more accurate. Um, has anyone ever put in this tree was 971 millimetres or 971.5 millimetres to determine the level of error? I mean, that's when we, when we measure in millimetres, our accuracy is plus or minus half a millimetre. Um, I don't think anyone does. So we, we've rounded that almost certainly. Um, and that's okay. Um, just be aware that's the case. There's some limitations to the report. That's in the right re report. Now we've got test results, but we've already given some of our results back up here. So test results, that's fine. So test results can go with observations. Um, then there's a summary of information here. Um, the canopy of the tree is dominant in the surrounding area. Um, well, that's not a test result. That's an observation. So really, this would have been better off having observations with a subheading of test result. Test results show that the tree had 68% sound wood. Anyone want to interpret? Anyone here familiar with a, a tomograph enough to be able to understand what that says? Or do you want me to in interpret that? Peter? No, go for it. I, I'm happy for you to interpret that. Okay. It's like so a very precise number to me. It is a very precise number. So what, what is saying is, and we can look at the graph later on, um, about 68% of the wood is solid, sound. There's no evidence of any loss of strength or any change in the properties of the wood. 14% has some changes in the wood, and the rest suggests that it's decaying. So that's 70, 82, so about 18% uh, decay, where there's, there's loss of all strength, and about 82%. Um, that's either solid or transitioning, you know, maybe some earlier incipient um, um, decay. Maddox formula, the TR formula, works on a 51% um, threshold or a loss of half of the, the sound wood. So when we talk about 0.7 times 0.7, that's 49, that's 70%, 70%, 49 when we square it. Um, and so we have 51% solid material, 49% hollow. At that point of time, Maddox says, now you should start thinking about the tree. At less than that, you wouldn't worry about the decay in itself. It's not a big issue, is what he's suggesting. And since Maddox did his TR equation, there's been lots of discussion, lots of debates. Uh, you can read papers by Bond, uh, Gruber, uh, Wesley, um, to name three um, off the top of my eye, talent for. Um, so you can have a look at these authors and they'll discuss various bits. Um, or you can go look at an author by the name of Maddock. Maddock actually wrote a wonderful paper out of Tasmania. And uh, if someone wants a copy of it, I'll happily flick them a copy. It's uh, available online uh, where he looks at eucalypts and he says, well, you know, once we got the eucalypts were greater than 85 centimetres in diameter, we tended to find that the TR ratio was fairly unreliable for a whole pile of reasons. For example, the tops had broken out of the old trees at some stage or other, and they were behaving more like uh, static masses, as uh, Ken James would explain, rather than dynamic masses, because the branch structure wasn't of a typical swaying tree. It was more of a big pole with some branches at the top. Um, so at 50% decay, rough round figures, or 70% of the radius of decay, uh, we start to think about what we're going to do with the tree, not necessarily that we need to remove it. just want to make that clear. Uh, and you can see some decay here. 
in the branch. Uh, and you can see a tomograph um, being set up here. Now, it's hard to see from um, the tomograph where he's got his points uh, attached. But my guesstimate is um, tomography works by sound traveling in a straight line. And if it takes longer to travel, then it's no longer traveling in a straight line. My guess is that as soon as you start working on a tree with a buttress, you've got problems. Because if I tested from there to there, it can't go in a straight line between the two buttresses. It must go into the center of the tree and back out, which means it'll give the appearance that there's altered wood there. Does that make sense, Rob? Makes sense to me, yep. yeah. Vicky? Yep. It makes sense to me. Sorry, I haven't lost that, Vicky. You're just saying that makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, buttress trees are very difficult to, to uh, use standard tomography on and have any reliability. The other thing that's interesting is the further you get out from the centre of the tree, the more support you get from the wood. Just like me standing up now and putting my legs wide, wide apart, I've got more stability than if my legs were close together. Okay, so tissue further out is more stable, so the buttresses are more stable. So it really is a difficult one. Where do you test? The answer is you should ideally test in the sinuses and you should treat these as extra tissue on top um, that gives stability. And, you know, for that reason, failure of whole stems of, of um, fig because of decay in the stem hollow is pretty rare. And, I, and I'll demonstrate that with um, an example from, from experience that we all know and that is strangler figs work on that exact principle. They strangle a tree. Morton Bay figs a strangler fig. It goes around an old tree and then the old tree dies in the middle and you end up with this matrix of fig around the outside holding the tree up all the same. Um, so it's not uncommon for them to um, be able to stay standing quite, um, quite well in that situation. In fact, the two tallest uh, Morton Bay figs, the two biggest Morton Bay figs in Australia so far at Bullingen, and both of those started as emergent um, trees growing as um, epiphytes around another big tree. And uh, I think you've seen them with us, Peter. They're about yep. uh, 45 metres odd of trunk before you see anything else. They're just amazing trees. Mm. Um so, yes, the buttress is very difficult application of a tomograph. Um, and so both trees have been tested. Um, now we get some comments here in test results, something about fig slit damage was present on both trees. And so both trees, and yet now we get to tree two's report. And you can see how it's just been a very stream of conscious type report um, that really does start to get... Um, difficult to follow. And here, wasn't able to test um, the whole tree because of the equipment that he had, and that's fair enough. He's been honest about that. So he's going to test an 80 centimetre diameter branch. And that 80 centimetre diameter branch, he found to have 98% solid wood. So there wasn't a lot of decay there. Can we agree? Mm. Yeah, good. And so here's the test of the solid bit of wood. Mind you, I think you can see already there a slight sinus that will automatically alter the transmission speed of wood because it's got to go around that curve. doesn't matter what you want to do. And indeed, um, we start seeing areas where there's starting to get some problems when you look at the sinuses. Yeah, can you see that? They, uh, we know that there can't be early decay here because the tissue is alive. It's just purely the fact that we're looking at a sinus that creates the error there. Oh, we've got some material oozing out of the tree, so we've got some fluids. We've definitely got something happening on the inside. Um, we've got some um, heat damage, some scalding of the tissue. Um, 
And I'm not so sure, and I've, I've made this comment many a times, I'm not so sure that sunburn is the right term to use for damage caused uh, to trees um, on the top side. I, I think it is heat scalding or heat damage uh, more so than it is um, um, sunburn in the sense of UV. I'm not so sure that UV damage um, to the bark is that significant. And the rationale behind that, of course, is you get a day that's 42 or 43 degrees. That's the ambient temperature. The direct temperature in the sunlight is over 60 degrees. 60 degrees is enough to sterilise something. How do plants stop that from being an issue? Well, the answer is they use water um, and they add volume. So um, if you have a tree that's stressed and it can't cool itself, um, it's more likely to be harmed. So um, there has been a prior failure. Um, and there's an image of that, and there's clearly some uh, um, decay there. What failed? It was a limb. Um, so he's been quite clear about that. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, so now we've got conclusions. We haven't had much of an observation. We've had no discussion, and now we've got a conclusion. Uh, and that's where it starts to get difficult, because we don't understand how he's got to the conclusion. So both trees have clear evidence of stress, as is evidenced by the thinning of the canopy, poor vigour, and as tree two, a large diameter branch failure, due to the poor condition of the canopies, this may be an indication that roots of these trees have been affected by a decay pathogen. Windthrow is an unlikely situation due to low dome canopies. However, failure of the root plate should not be discounted. So I can't dismiss it altogether, but not likely to fail if there is, is uh, damage there. Both canopies are suffering the effects of fig psyllid. Leaves found on the ground below the tree show evidence, also showed evidence of fig psyllid. The presence of fig psyllid on these trees is at, a, at alarming levels. So, um, Rob, you're in Melbourne, aren't you? I am, yes. Yeah, so you get fig psyllid down there, particularly on the ones in the city on Moreton Bay figs. Uh, Vicky, where are you from? I'm from Sydney. Sydney, okay. So you're very familiar with uh, fig psyllid then. Um, every now and again, fig psyllid numbers get very high. Um, <clears throat> the leaves start to become functionless. And um, most figs are drought deciduous species. They'll drop their canopy when they're heavily stressed or when the uh, soil moisture levels are really low. And so, indeed, Moreton Bay figs do that they're, as the levels get higher and higher. Uh, they start to drop their bundle. The other thing that happens is fig psyllid or psyllids in general are attacked by wasp species. Um, and ideally, um, the leaves would be left uh, on the ground. The, the psyllid, once it's on the ground, can't uh, crawl up. It's a covered psyllid, so it needs to have a covering over or a test or a lerp, call it whatever you want. Uh, so it's not going to be able to crawl back up and reinfect the tree. But any of the psyllids that survive that have wasps inside them, they're uh, a parasitoid wasp, so they, um, the female lays a single egg inside the psyllid and it starts to take over, comes to maturity, uh, comes out and then keeps on going. So um, if we leave the leaves on the ground under these big drop situations, the, the fig psyllid situation self-rectifies itself. So we definitely have a fig psyllid problem. He's, talked about that but there's been no discussion as to whether that's why the tree is looking so stressed um, except we can conclude that that's the case from what he's told us here in the conclusions but he hasn't made that conclusion for us Chris talk. Um, sorry about that guys i'll kill that Okay, um, so yes, we're not we're not given that information in a logical process. We're not told the trees are looking sparse, um, the canopies are thin, um, large amounts of, of fig psyllid or alarmingly large amounts of fig psyllid are present. Um, the fig psyllids may be responsible, and, and in fact, he says here in the conclusions, fig psyllid is responsible for periodic defoliation of Morton Bay fig. 
But because it hasn't come in the sequence of things, it starts to make the report look like it's been written for a purpose other than what it is. That is, this report is, is being written to support the removal of the trees. I said, I don't think it was. Um, knowing the author, I think it was just one of those things that it got put together in a rush, got put together in a poor process, and it sounds uh, horrible. And I'll share, uh, as I was saying, Peter, I'll share a few in the next uh, couple of blocks that I've written that have been absolute doozers, uh, and you'll see the same sort of problems start to occur. Um, a good biological control is to leave the um, leaves at the base of the tree. Uh, mulch area will also make it easier to invite natural predators to feed on the psyllids. Um, so there's, he's discussed this here. Uh, tree one has confirmed foliaginous from the pathology testing and the tomogram indicates decay is present uh, at the test site due to the patchiness of the colour shown in the tomogram. Misinterpreted, that's fine. Based on the TR ratio assessed against the test levels, the tree does not pose a risk of failure. Yep. Everyone read that there? The tree does not pose a risk of failure. Well, I don't think he understands that, what that means because um, well, I think what he is meaning is that the risk of failure is not high or not, un not unacceptable. Yeah, yeah, it's not something that we'd anticipate. It's something that we could effectively dismiss. Um, it's going to be back down the same level as, as it is with most trees. And that's what Maddox was saying with his TR ratios. We start to worry about the TR ratio when um, the TR ratio starts to get to that 0.5. It is not when we're meant to get rid of trees. And I, I can say that absolutely bluntly um, at about the same time uh, Matic was doing TR. Uh, Wesley was doing his stuff on statics, and uh, I picked up an Australia, uh, sorry, an English translation of uh, Wesley's papers, about three or four hundred pages of it. And I was getting concerned about the conflicts of interest, so I, I hopped on a plane and went over and saw Matic in uh, Santa Monica, and uh, said to him, "Class, I don't understand. Um, you're saying." Uh, Point um, five is when we should be doing something or 70% of, of radius. And um, why are we removing the trees? And he said, I never said remove trees. He said, I said, at less than that, you don't even worry about it. At less than the 70%, there's no point thinking about it. You might think about it for other reasons, but you're not going to think about it in terms of increased likelihood of failure. So then he quotes uh, a section from... Um, the Botanic Gardens, the RBG's Royal Botanic Gardens. Um, Felina species are primary tree pathogens causing rot, white rot in trunks and branches of living trees and are able to kill the host. I'm not so sure that that's a, a correct conclusion on behalf of Botanic Gardens. Um, I've only ever seen one grey box killed or uh, fail um, from Felinus, but I've seen grey box kill Felinus. Um, I've seen Sydney blue gum. Um, with felinus where the um, other organisms have taken over. So um, yes, they are able to kill, but they're not always pathogens and they're not always uh, virulent at all. Um, so depending on the species of felinus, felinus noxious, the root fungus, um, horrible and it's just destroying uh, figs. We know it's down below grafting now. Peter, do you know how far it's got at all? I, I'm only aware of it being as far as Grafton, but I'm sure it must be further. It's just that we probably haven't noticed it. Uh, you remember the one outside the old Catholic school there at Grafton? It actually fell over. I don't know that I'm aware of that one. Um, it, okay. So there was one there that we did look at and it has fallen over. Um, so that gives you an idea that it had been there for a few years at least anyhow. Uh, fell over, I uh, think, in about... Uh, about 2016 or 2017. Um, and uh, speaking to Craig Hallam uh, about this, he and Francis Swartz have been doing lots of work on trying to control uh, Felinus noxious using uh, trichoderma, um, bred for the purpose. And Craig's of the view that it'll get to at least Port Macquarie um, without any problems at all in terms of environmental conditions. So I think um, it's fair to say that we should probably expect it in Sydney on the coastline at some stage. Um, and it went 
down. It went down from, it was reported as low as, Byron Bay, I think in about 2014. So it seems to have moved at a fairly good pace. Um, I'm not sure that it's moving, Mark. I, I think that maybe that we just haven't noticed that. Yeah, okay. I, I think that's probably a fair comment, although I'm sure that it is, um, the distribution is increasing as well. It may not be, but that'll be interesting to see. Um, so, okay, tree two does not have confirmed felinus but from the, from the pathology testing. However, the exudate leaking from between the buttress roots is a strong indication there's a large pockets of decay holding moisture um, that leak out in high rainfall. So there's a cavity in the tree. Um, remember, he couldn't test the cavity on that one. His equipment wouldn't allow him to do it. Due to the age and condition of these trees, it's not possible, sorry, it is not possible that these trees Will recover from the advanced state of decline. Well, I think that was an erroneous conclusion, but I can see how he's got there with just getting his his things all confused and muddled up. Um, certainly, the um, the same thing is said about the domain fig trees, which was a massive debacle a number of years ago. Um, there are a number of trees there that were considered unstable and unsound when they cut them down. There were pockets of decay, sometimes as extensive as ten percent. Um, so essentially no decay. Uh, one of the trees was left, it's the tree of truth. It's the tree where the politicians go to to deliver um, their press statements, state politicians. And in the land environment court that ensued over the, the removal of those trees, um, one of the comments that was made is that the tree of truth wasn't really a risk to people. The only people that were underneath it were politicians and journalists, and they really don't count. Um, and I thought that was a a rather nice comment uh, to make. So um, th that tree, the tree of truth was considered um, to be a tree in such poor condition that it needed to be removed as a matter of priority. Probably wouldn't do another five or 10 years. And of course it's done more than that now and continues to perform in good health. So um, um, it's probably an erase. Now we've got some recommendations based on uh, tomogram, VTA and pathology results. I have the following recommendations for these two trees. Due to the conf uh, confirmed presence of felinus, overall poor vigour of the tree. How do we know the tree's in poor vigour? Anyone? We don't. We don't. He's just said so in the recommendations. I'll just try a little quick test here. Control F. And I'll just move this little thing over to the side and I'll go vigour. V-I-G, let's see what we've got. We've got vigour there, okay. It's the first time the word vigour's come up. Overall health capacity, let's have a look, see if we get health. And by the way, health, vigour and vitality are three different words that Shigo, at least, intended to mean different things. There is good evidence to support that healthy uh, trees are less affected by fig trillid than trees under stress. Well, that's true. Um, the fact that they're affected more doesn't mean that the trees are not in good condition. Do we see anything that says the trees are stressed? S-T-R-E-S-S. -S. I'm just trying to find as many ways. Bad trees have clear evidence of stress as is evidenced by the thinning canopies, the canopies that can be caused to shed as a result of fig psyllid. So we get nothing until here that really indicates that the tree's in poor vigor and we don't know how that's concluded. So if you're gonna make a statement in your observation, the tree is in poor health, what is it that tells you the tree's in poor health? Dead tips, declining canopy, poor leaf size. Um, um, I think uh, um, poor leaf or canopy colour. Um, and there's some that I can get there quickly. So they're things that we're going to be wanting to look at. Just on the point of the, the shy goes difference between points. Um, 
health, uh, uh, well, let's go vigor first of all. Vigor is a genetic capacity. So a vigorous species of tree might be camphor laurel. Ficus is a vigorous species of tree. Health is how the tree is currently performing. The tree is healthy. Um, vitality is about its potential to uh, adapt to the current situation. So um, a tree that has just lost all of its leaves through hail damage is in poor health. But it's got huge amounts of carbohydrate reserves and it's ready to put on a new canopy. It's camp laurel. So it's vigorous. It's got great vitality. It's got great capacity, genetic and, and uh, current capacity, to respond to the conditions that it's in. So three words all used similar, simultaneously. The Australian standard says that those three words are treated the same, um, but Shigo chose to treat them separately, and I think there's good reason to do so. So to look at a tree that's a vigorous species or a vigorous genus, uh, Ficus is a fairly vigorous genus. Um, the, these trees were in poor health, but at no stage did anyone test the vitality of these trees. In other words, if these trees had huge amounts of carbohydrate reserves in the root system, um, they are able to respond rapidly and produce a new canopy. The fact that they're in poor health was irrelevant. And Peter, I know you've done it, and uh, Vicky, you can do it. You can go have a look at the Susan Street Council Car Park at Auburn. And the fig next door there was a heritage fig that they were thinking about getting rid of. Um, the tree was in poor condition. The canopy was less than 50. <coughs> no fig it. It was in poor condition. Um, that tree today is pristine. You wouldn't notice that it had. And they used that nasty chemical. We got a permit to use it. Peter knows about it. Mm. Killed 53 people last year. Horrible chemical. It's called water. Um, that's the only thing we changed in that tree is we added an irrigation system to the tree um, using the um, stormwater from the, the car park, put it into a tank beneath the car park, and uh, it gives it a reliable source of irrigation. Uh, and the tree is just growing like crazy now. So uh, trees in poor vigour, well, I don't know that uh, that was tested. Um, I think that's just a conclusion that he's come to now because the picture looks like that. And that's because he's not separated things out. And then tree two is even more amazing. Although testing did not confirm the presence of Philonis, due to the element of risk that uh, this tree could fail at another lateral branch, I have recommended this tree be removed due to being structurally compromised within the main uh, stem. Remember the other bit that failed wasn't the main stem, it was the branch. And the branch failed, not the stem. Um, and then these trees should be disposed of a landfill uh, site to limit the risk of spread of the felinus. Now, um, there is no evidence that suggests that um, chipping felinus robusta, felinus batius, any of the stem felinus, uh, casuarina, um, spreads the, the fungus at all. Um, there is good research that shows that Felinus is almost certainly an endophyte. That is, it's already in the tree before an injury occurs. There is almost no evidence to suggest that a pruning cut causes felinus. Interestingly enough, um, you'll almost never see felinus growing at the end. In fact, I can barely think of an occasion where I have uh, at the end of a, a pruning cut. So felinus appears as though it's an endophyte and Professor Lynn Body's work on that, or Bodie's work, B O W D Y, I'm pretty sure it is, um, is worth uh, checking up on that. And she's done heaps now to demonstrate that most of these stem fungi um, start life as an endophyte. That is, they're actually in the living tissue um, at, at the time the uh, infection starts. Um, and so then the, there's a glossary, which I think is great. Um, um, Defines some of the words that he's used. So, vigor, overall health or capacity to grow and resist uh, physiological stress. So, he's used the word um, vigor correctly, um, apart from overall health, capacity to grow and resist physiological stress, um, but no testing. And if you haven't ever done it, the, the test for this would be an IKI test uh, or a shigometer, so electrical impedance test could be used. Um, you could just look at elongation, a uh, little hard on ficus, but you can do um, um, 
uh, stem elongation uh, estimate still. Um, hard when you've got no canopy and uh, an ICAR test works well there, there or a Muller's reagent, um, Lugol solution, any of those to test starch. Um, in terms of um, otherwise, if the canopy was there, um, there's been some good work done now on using fluorescent, uh, fluorescence um, meters to measure um, photosynthetic, photosynthetic activity. Um, but again, doesn't work well when you've got a tree that's losing its canopy or lost its canopy. Um, so, and an iodine and potassium iodide test, um, just the, the reagent and the basic equipment to do it with uh, a really simple thing on a ficus would set you back probably $25 or $30. So it's not a complex process. Um, some explanatory notes, now that's great. And I think that's where a lot of his stuff should be, his discussions on TR, and this is that mathematical equation he's talking about where we get down to 51%. Um, there's an illustration, that's really good stuff. And, and I think he's got that in the right spot. And then a bibliography. I, I wonder how much of the, that bibliography has actually been referenced above. I don't think um, a lot of it has. If you've got a bibliography, make sure it's actually um, informing the above information and you've cited it above so that the reader knows what you're looking at. And um, whilst it's really good to cite an author, um, if you're playing fairly in a expert witness report, also try and reference the page numbers um, rather than making people go through a 900-page uh, uh, textbook to try and find a, a particular paper. If you're doing a paper, then it's fine. It's the paper cited. But if you're doing a textbook, um, cite the page numbers of the textbook. If you're not a nice person, then don't. Um, but it's really good to help. Again, um, as another expert, dealing with an expert, you want the other party to see and understand the things you're talking about. And Peter, we, you and I have talked about this a fair bit over the last couple of years. When you're going into an expert's conclave, when you're dealing with another expert, you want them to try and get on, on the same page with you as quickly as possible and understand where you're coming from. And so assisting them in that rather than hindering in that is a, is a good thing. So, um, and here he's got, you know, he's used a, a, a paper. So in, the, in a paper situation, uh, you can't get it wrong, but in a textbook, I don't notice he's got one here. Um, and he's got his page numbers in, and that's just really a great way to assist the reader in being able to find information. The test results from the RBG, um, really interesting. Um, sent away for Ganoderma infection. He was worried about a root rot of, um, or a butt rot of um, the figs. Didn't come back positive, but they found felinus. Now, we're dealing with this sort of stuff all the time now. The DNA is a PCR test, you know that now. Polymer chain reaction. Um, we're, we're seeing them used all the time with COVID-19. And, you know, if, if you tested uh, anywhere in the suburb of Shane's Park enough and you amplified the DNA enough, you'd find my DNA. It's all over the suburb. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm living in every property in Shane's Park. It just means that the more you amplify something, the more likely you are to find something. Um, so... The fact that felinus was found or uh, any of these things are found doesn't necessarily confirm that they're causing uh, any problems. What is interesting is, is um, the Botanic Gardens have pointed out that it's a white rot. Um, and they've got a lovely little phrase. I'm just going to find it for you. Uh, environmental stress is known to predispose trees to infection. Um, and that's true. That's when they're stressed. This is when that endophytic reaction starts to uh, uh, erupt. Um, identifying and reducing environmental stress factors and improving health uh, may slow the disease progression uh, and also increases plant growth. So both are positive. Plant health can be improved. The application of organic fertilizer and root growth promoters such as a seaweed-based fertilizer um, root growth can actually be stimulated with just mulch and water. Um, and I'm just trying to find the one that he says here. Maybe it's not there. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, 
conferences attended, workshops attended. Um, again, in a CV, I'm not so sure that's something that I'd put. So I just left those there just to say, um, if there's a, a workshop you've attended that's relevant to the actual report, you might put that in. Um, in terms of a general report, I, I would have a very basic set of um, things, just like Edward has done here, is, is just given his title. That's it. So you don't necessarily need a whole pile of um, CV material and report. The only time that's required is when. Expert witness report. Expert witness report, you must include it. And just to stop it, I know we didn't talk about it last block, but uh, it's an important one. Is at no stage is it, in my mind, appropriate to put down all the court cases you've had and the results of all those court cases? In my mind, that suggests that perhaps you might be an opinion for <laughs> sort of a flag. So your job is not there to um, say how many court cases you've won or you've lost. Um, your job is to simply to give expert evidence. But I'm sure he said somewhere around here about an arborist being involved. Oh, yes, here it is. Last, therefore, we recommend that the structure and integrity of the tree be assessed, especially if it is located near buildings or a fire affair. So that's the Botanic Gardens recommendation is have an arborist assess the tree. The arborist says, based on the Botanic Gardens report, we should remove the tree. Do you see the difference between the two? And that's just because, again, he's just lost this sequencing. What he should have said is the Botanic Gardens have detected um, felinus in this tree. Okay. At this stage, there, there's X, it's a white rot, um, you know, and how much decay we've currently got. That would be the, the process. So uh, it is a report that reads awkwardly. And it reads like, um, as I said, it reads like somebody said to him, write a report to support the removal of the tree, and he's gone and done that. I, I'm almost certain that that's not the case. I think what's happened is because he's laid it out the way he has, he hasn't followed the system. And what it reads like is this report is an opinion for hire. He's said that the trees should be removed and he's cited the risk from the trees as one of the main reasons for it, but it doesn't seem to have been any risk assessment done. No, it, it's, as I said, it just hasn't followed. So if you're going to make a statement in the conclusion, any statement you make in the conclusion must be supported by discussion. So we go back the other way. Um, both clears are, have clear evidence of stress. Um, well, tell me about that stress. There's thinning canopies. Well, they should have been up higher. Poor vigor. We don't know how he's determined this poor vigor. Uh, and and as with tree two, a large uh, dome and a branch failure. Well, do we know whether that's related to stress or not? We don't. So if he wants to say that was related to, to stress, he could do so, and there's nothing wrong with that. Somewhere in his observations, he should have said, uh, tree two has lost a large branch. My examination of the tree revealed blah, blah or the, the failure revealed blah, and as a result, um, blah, 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 blah. In the conclusion then, he would say, because of blah, 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 uh, it's reasonable to conclude that the branch failed as a result of stress. So one great way to check your report is to go through, and make sure that everything in your conclusion is discussed in the discussion and everything in your discussion, everything in your discussion that you're relying on is either given from a scientific paper or a journal article or a textbook or from your observations, or you tell the reader, anecdotally, this is my experience. And that anecdotally, this is my experience is the worst sort of evidence you want to, or justification you want to give um, for uh, your, your discussion, but it's still a valid process as experts. Uh, and we heard that last block, 
Um, as experts, our experience matters. Um, it's not that it doesn't count and it's not that it hasn't got value. It's just that it's a lot better to say, it's my experience that, that fig salad um, numbers increase rapidly when more than 22 uh, eggs are found on a, each leaf on average, taking six random samples from the end. And I think that's the, the figure, Peter, I don't know whether you can remember the paper. Um, Nick Collett referred to it down at University of Melbourne. Um, so it's purely a, a, a threshold based on the number of uh, eggs present when they get too high, the population grows rapidly. It's not necessarily to do with the tree being stressed. Um, that's my opinion. Uh, if I'm going to make that, give that opinion, I've got to give some substantiation for it, or I've got to come up with a paper to support it. And that's the, the scientific process. If we follow that, so we go conclusions back to discussion, discussion back to um, observations. And if you're anything like me as a report writer, some of you may sit down, and I know that we've just got the four here, but others will be viewing this later. If you can sit down and write a report from front to back without stopping, you're my hero. I just think you're amazing. Um, as I'm writing, I'm writing something, and all of a sudden I think I need to discuss that. And then I've got to go back to the observations and make sure I've put that into the observations. Um, then I get to the end and I get to the discussion, uh, the conclusion, and I write something in the conclusion. I think, oh, hell, I haven't discussed that and I've just concluded it. I've got to go now back and add that into the discussion. And then for the discussion, I've got to add it back into the observations or put in the observations, discuss, and then go back through. And one of the things that my team say regularly is, I got a whole pile of incomplete sentences or incomplete paragraphs. They'll be going through and doing an edit. I'll say, you're really clear that you're writing something and then all of a sudden you've got distracted. And I said, yeah, and the most common distraction is I realise I've got to put something somewhere earlier in the document. That is by far the most common distraction I have when writing. Um, so if, if you get into the habit of just making sure that everything in your conclusion is supported in the discussion, everything in the discussion is supported by observation and paper or a clearly expressed opinion. That is, it's my experience that, it's my view that, I'm of the belief that, perfectly acceptable, but you've got to let the reader know how you've come to that. Um, and this report is one of those reports that doesn't, when you're doing trees and development site, that's what we're being asked to do. We've been asked to substantiate the trees will remain viable. There are some great papers, Hamilton, Harris, um, Smiley. Um, uh, I can't think of the correct name for Cecil. Um, big, long name, Dutch, just gone over to the US to, uh, or Canada, one of the two to a lecture over there. Um, he's just had a, a book. Let me pull it up. I'll find it for you. Um, he gives a great little discussion on uh, root morphology, um, what resources, uh, all references. I don't know. Can you see, you can't see my, can you see that page there? Is that being shared? No. No? No. Let me... Um, to share that if I can, and then we'll call it quits at that. Um, share uh, and yeah, okay. So I've got standard things that I use as you can see that now. Yeah, Word actually has the facilities to put in uh, references. Um, you can go and grab. Um, but here's a little thing recently I, I got out on root morphology uh, and I'm getting in trouble for Cecil for saying it. it's conigenetic you know, close enough Cecil um, it's a lot easier for me to say um, but great little um, explanation of the morphology of most trees um, if we go back 50 years ago root systems were described as being tap roots um, that's largely not the case. Um, then we got the flattened root plate, um, which is largely not the case. Um, 
now we've got the stage where we understand that um, apart from on really heavy clay soils, most trees have some form of sinker root system, heart rooting, uh, and structural stability is critical closest to the tree. Um, and um, it's interesting when Maddox talks about his uh, equation for um, uh, um, the structural um, stability of a tree for its root system, he ignores heart rooters and he ignores tap rooters uh, in that equation, except in his textbook. In his textbook, he raises it well. Um, but in his uh, actual equation, he doesn't. And of course, um, hard to believe, but um, in most soils, eucalypts will develop sinker roots and heart root, uh, tap roots. Um, so they, they do like to have deeper roots. And the real classical place where you see that is head along uh, uh, the Murrumbidgee and have a look at exposed eucalyptus root systems that have been washed out during uh, flood events. And you'll see uh, often a dimorphic or a trimorphic. So you'll see several layers of their root system um, and then lots of these big sinker roots. So, um, but yes, so, um, and there's a, a typical example. I'm storing references that I use. I have standard ones that I already put into my um, reports. Um, Word has the ability for you to set it up in Word. Um, if you're using um, uh, referencing software, there is software available, you can use that. Wherever it is, start collecting references. When you're reading a report by another arborist, and you will do that, you should do that, um, try and review a, another arborist report at least once a month, um, just to give you some ideas about layout, readability, um, give yourself some benchmarking against your own. And you'll get great references as well. Um, one of the things I loved about students' work and marking was every now and again, I'd come across just really wonderful, obscure reference that someone had found and uh, I'd sit there and think, oh, it's a beauty. Um, and so you want to start compiling your references so that you can um, use them effectively. It saves you time, particularly when it's on a, a limited subject um, that you're doing all the time. If it's something new, that's fine, but you know, we're all dealing with trees and development sites on a fairly regular basis. So we should have 20 or 30 standard references that we use um, when it comes to talking about uh, uh, those things. Any questions before we go, guys? Uh, there's a couple of things in the chat. Have you seen them, Mark? No, uh, no. I'm, when I'm doing this, I'm not looking at the chat. So let me see if I can open it. So what's the study on the eucalypts in Tasmania? Um, yeah, Peter, if you'd be nice enough to send me... Um, um, an email, I'll yeah. uh, send you a copy of that and you can circulate it to anyone that emails you and asks you for it. Okay. Uh, and there's a comment about sunburn. Yeah, sunburn versus comment. heat's cold. Mm. So when we get sunburn as a person, we're actually getting UV damage, not heat damage. When trees are getting heat scald, it's heat that's causing the damage, not um, not UV. Mm. Um, so uh, sunscald would work? Yeah, sunscald works. Um, sunburn is, is just a, a, again, it's one of those little things that don't matter but do. I mean, uh, there was a brilliant dentist out of Queensland who described these things as the critically essential non-essentials. Um, so how would the use of white paint um, work for heat scald? It, it, it does do some benefits because it's got a high reflective index. Um, it, it, one of the things that's interesting is we talk about this sunburn and what it is, but if sunburn were an issue, and um, Rob, you might not have had this happen in Melbourne, but Vicky, we certainly did in Sydney, um, in the 1970s, 1980s, trees were being lopped all the time. If sudden burn were an issue to do with UV, when we cut off the branches in the middle of summer, all those trees should have got massive sun burn on the top side because they're all been getting full exposure to UV. They didn't. Okay, so we know that it's not UV damage. Um, we know that it's it's something different to UV damage. And it's interesting, trees that have root systems that have been harmed or trees that are suffering from drought that have this happen to them are more likely to get heat damage. 
the top side. And that makes good sense because there's less water to flow through. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and we certainly know it from transplanting. If we can keep um, moisture levels I ideal, um, if we can put a misting system in a tree, even if it, if it uh, sheds, um, not that you want to put a misting system in some trees because you'll end up with too much moisture in the root plate, but um, on things like ficus that do it really well, um, you'll get no UV damage, even though um, you've got no canopy with, if they drop the bundle. So again, the evidence is really clear from um, just simply the way that plants respond that um, misting doesn't stop UV, misting stops heat. Mm. Uh, it's a cooling process. Um, and when trees lose their leaves, they do lose their ability to, um, to move water. So there is an increased problem there. So lopping does have some effect, um, but not enough to cause burn on the top side when you lop a fig in the middle of summer. I'm not saying that we should do that. I'm just saying that, you know, um, if you go around Wallara, Wallara, I think it's got about uh, six or 700 ficus that were, I remember seeing the contract when I was a younger contractor, the contract read, um, lop trees under wires and balance prune other side of the street. And lop trees under the wires, that was self-explanatory, spike up them, cut the top off, and balance pruning meant go to the other side of the road and cut the other side of the road uh, so that the trees were at the same height. And that was done to several hundred um, figs just in Wallara alone. So if you look at it from that point of view, um, if, if some burn were the problem, then all of those trees would have got some burn UV damage. Um, they didn't um, They didn't get heat damage either. Um, their capacity to deal with that was because their root system was still good and functional. They had good moisture levels in the stems when that was done and they didn't cook themselves to death. Okay. Yep. Just uh, can I just add to that? In um, a very good example in Melbourne, in the week leading up to the Black Saturday bushfires, it was a week of temperatures over 40 degrees, so trees became dehydrated, and then um, lots of those trees which had been um, hollowed out for overhead cables did suffer from um, that impact on the upper side of their branches, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so um, we, we're, we're comfortable with saying that we know that it is to do with heat and we're comfortable to say that a functional root system uh, is an important part of avoiding that problem, uh, soil moisture being the, um, or availability of moisture uh, physiologically is a part of that issue. Okay, guys, well, we'll see you next month. Um, anything else, Peter? That's it, I think, Mark. Thank you again. It's okay, guys. See you next year. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.